Welcome to Pseudopod, where the only thing more horrifying than horror is the possibility you might push through a story that makes you uncomfortable or actively disturbs you. Don't. We're here to entertainingly disturb, not straight up disturb, and you can always hop back on next week. A quick word, folks. There is no direct violence in this story, but it is going to be profoundly uncomfortable listening for, I suspect, a lot of people. Please proceed aware. Pseudopod, episode 707, June 12th, 2020. This week's story, Crybaby, by P.R. Dean. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes with us from P.R. Dean. It's a Pseudopod original, too. P.R. Dean is a writer from Brisbane, Australia. He has written plays, musicals, opera librettos, and the occasional short story. Your reader for this story is our very own Scott Campbell. So, without further ado, and without making eye contact with the people at the other end of the street, we have a story for you. And we're terrified. It's true. Crybaby by P.R. Dean Narrated by Scott Campbell The lights came up abruptly. Audience members shifted in their seats and whispered in shocked voices. No one laughed. After a moment, someone stood up, and then one by one people rose to their feet, adopted a neutral expression, and waited patiently for those in front of them to move. Leon felt oppressed by the harsh fluorescent light. The world of the film, with its deep shadows and French vowels, still clung to his sensibilities. He hunched down in the seat and shaded his eyes against the glare. His hand was shaking. He wanted to leave the moment the credits began to roll, but Haley had glared at him as though he was transgressing some long-standing film festival behavior code. What did it matter? Dozens had walked out during the screening. Part of him wanted to curl up into a ball and not think about anything. The other part just wanted him to get out of the cinema and go somewhere else. He was being ridiculous. He knew that. Overreacting. Just tired, probably. His eyes felt gritty. He'd been out five nights in a row. He had to work in the morning, and he had an overdue assignment. Had he even had a shower this morning? He couldn't remember. He lowered his hand and opened his eyes when he realized the cinema had grown quieter. There were a dozen or so people still slumped in seats, but most had left. The tail end of the queue was shuffling towards the exit. Haley was staring into space and giving no indication she was ready to leave. Her face appeared drawn and pale. The pimple on her forehead stood out. Her hair looked greasy. When he touched her in the arm, she flinched, and after looking around, snatched her bag from the floor and stood up. Leon shrugged into his backpack and followed her down the row of seats and into the aisle. The line came to a stop when they were several meters from the door. Leon let his chin rest on his chest and stared at his feet. One of the first things he noticed in a unnerving moment was that the film's victim wore the exact same Puma trainers he did. Very popular. Millions of pairs sold all over the world trainers, he reminded himself. The queue edged forward. He lifted his head and looked at the pink ends of Haley's hair tangled across her black jumper. He could just see the contour of her bra strap and imagine the skin indentations that would remain as she removed it. She hadn't looked back once since they got up. They had been sort of going out for three months. Haley was okay. He suspected they both put up with each other because they couldn't get anything better. Not exactly the worst basis for a relationship, he thought. At least crushing disappointment was in waiting around the corner. They finally made it through the door. Wall height posters for the cinema of cruelty, Europe's new extremists, lined the corridor that led to the foyer. Benny's video irreversible, anatomy of hell, then crybaby. Wait, the John Waters teen film, he asked? Haley had looked at him like he was an idiot. There's no hyphen in a title. It's a film by France's preeminent female director. The crybaby poster showed the stretched denim-clad legs of the three young thugs. A hand, hanging beside a thigh, held a blood-spattered vodka bottle by the neck. 
The photograph had been taken from knee height, and just visible between the legs were a foot, a patch of denim, a fold of black t-shirt, and an arm with the wrist flopped against the length of pipe. In a sense, the poster misrepresented the film by its focus on the prone victim and the anonymity of the thugs. One of the striking and most unsettling aspects of the production was the way the stream of put-downs, arguments, and trivial banter was foreground, while the vicious and casual brutalization of the victim took place mostly off-screen. The victim was never fully visible, never spoke. His presence was indicated through brief, shadowed, extreme close-ups, splatters of blood and various wordless sounds of anguish and distress. It was like, thought Leon, how people drinking and arguing around a table would shred a cigarette packet or tear a coaster into strips or punch holes into a plastic cup with a fork, except it wasn't a coaster and it wasn't a plastic bag. It was a human being. The film opened in near darkness with the three crashing around, shouting, laughing, talking, and lights came up to reveal the dim, color-faded interior of a derelict building scattered with the detritus of modern society. There were so many shots that featured branded packaging in association with blood and vermin that it was like some weird anti-product placement. Leon realized he was staring at the forearm resisting against the pipe low down at the poster. In the middle of an argument that had nothing to do with the victim, one of the characters had lifted a booted foot, made some emphatic comment, and stomped. The camera had followed the boot. The bone broke with a crunch. The victim screamed, and moments later was heard throwing up. Oh, gross, said one of the characters, and then continued. And anyway, guitar bands are boring. Cut to a hand at the edge of the pool of vomit, just as someone in the cinema threw up. So there was a weird vermilicitude. Was that a mole beside the wristbone? That's what he'd been trying not to look at, or looking at and trying not to think about. He glanced at the mole on his own wrist before bending down, but looking closer only revealed a field of half-toned dots. He was seeing things that weren't there. When he straightened and turned around, the corridor was empty. Haley was waiting just inside the foyer. I was about to come looking for you. Sorry. People were standing in small groups in the foyer and out on the street, but there was none of the usual earnest discussion. Instead, they huddled together with the camaraderie of disaster survivors and spoke in hushed tones. They're having a Japanese fortnight in May, Haley said. She didn't seem to be in any hurry to leave. Leon glanced at the promotional material. They should have used the word cinema, not theater. Some of these older cinemas were live theaters once. This building was new, but the original regal around the corner was a theater before it became a cinema. But it's not the building, it's the use, Leon said. Show a film, it's a cinema. Put a boxing ring in the center, it's an arena. Fill it with water, said Haley. It's a swimming pool. Leon laughed and began moving towards the exit doors across the room. For a brief moment, he'd forgotten the experience of watching the film, but several stills from a display near the door threw him back into the horror of it. His heart rate increased. His neck and arms became clammy. I was just in a hypersensitive state, he thought, panicking about everything. He should go home and sleep. If he went straight home, he could just squeeze in eight hours and eat something. His blood sugar might be out of whack. That was probably what it was, actually. As they stepped into the cool, moist air of the street, Haley said, Do you want to come to mine? Okay, Leon said. He was trying to decide whether it was cold or not. Was the guy in the film wearing a jacket? You never saw him, really. Well, you certainly didn't, he thought. At the crucial moment, the absolute help-me-here moment, he glanced in her direction when she was looking down at her phone. A t-shirt, I think. Just an ordinary t-shirt, Haley said. Yes, a black t-shirt like the one I'm wearing, and a pair of jeans, and the same trainers. That meant if he put his jacket on, it would break the cycle. He would no longer be wearing the same clothes as the guy in the film. He levered his thumb under the strap of his backpack. That could sound a bit more enthusiastic. About what? I said, do you want to come to mine? And you said, okay. Like I asked to borrow money. I didn't say it like that, Leon said. Cinema patrons were drifting down both sides of the street. 
There was a car park around the corner and a taxi rack several blocks straight ahead. A few people had found parking spots out front and were climbing into their cars as though they were stars leaving a premiere. It was darker outside. He felt slightly less vulnerable, and the cooler air was drying the sweat and refreshing his thoughts. Perhaps in a few minutes he'll be laughing at himself or overreacting. He imagined explaining the experience in his tutorial group. After 112 minutes, I was primed to believe the most preposterous things. I was seduced by the irrational. This is the power of cinema. The sublime power of cinema. Thoughtful faces nodded at him. Would his classmates know sublime meant awe expiring? Probably not. What? Leon turned in Haley's direction. I said, are we just going to stand here? They began to walk along the street. He was going to do something, and now he'd forgotten what it was. That was very meta, said Haley. You think? The very first subtitle was, Belmondo's an actor, not a gangster. And someone answers, it's the same thing. Who said, you have thirty seconds to leave the theater, Leon asked. Haley looked blank for a moment. Oh, Jasper No. It was a title card at the beginning of one of his early films. I wonder if anyone did. I mean, it has a certain gleeful cruelty. Throw the most horrific images at an audience for two hours and then be able to say, Hey, we warned you not to watch. Sentimental cruelty. The new extremism. Though even no isn't quite as grotesque as what we just saw. Haley glared at him. You're just shocked that a female director could make a film like that. As though women don't know anything about horror and cruelty. I'll bet you considered the exact same scene more grotesque if you knew of a woman directed it. Because you have a stereotypical notion of women as gentle and more restrained. You weren't shocked by that? It was the most horrible thing I ever had to sit through. I think my soul's got blood on it. Not exactly entertainment, not a date flick. She took his arm. Isn't it supposed to be cathartic? Don't you mean cauterized? Not really. They were walking slowly. Leon could feel a sense of calm returning. He watched a black band cruise slowly down the street. Images from the film ghosted up in front of his eyes as he let his mind drift. There were many subconscious fears throwing themselves against the door of his mind trying to get out. Footpath, road, car, shop front. He said to himself, be in the moment. I'm taking Japanese animation next semester. Not so depressing. Haley said. I'll tell you what's different about Crybaby. There was a scream nearby. Leon's heart slammed against his ribcage. He stopped dead. It was a bird, said Haley. There was a, there was a bird, yeah? I hear them at night at home. An owl, maybe. There's parkland along the river. He tried to breathe. Footpath, road, building. What's different about Crybaby, he said, taking a deep breath. He said I can imagine the other examples. I mean, other examples of extreme cinema. I can imagine them happening. While we were sitting in there, somewhere in the world someone was being murdered, being raped, being beaten up, yeah? They waited at an intersection for the lights to change. It was a Thursday evening and the traffic was moderate. But I can't imagine three teenagers torturing, maybe murdering someone so casually. With such vicious insouciance. Yes, exactly, a good word. But that was exaggerated pushed to a kind of limit for cinematic purposes. Leon realized he was listening for the bird, or any other sudden sounds to guard against them. Hyperreal, said Haley. Bodily rod. The medium of the cinema collapses into the medium of reality to form the hyperreal. That's what I did my too, Don. You weren't there. I was unconscious due to excessive alcohol intake, he said. They'd been over this before. She kept saying he should be more supportive. Something moved in the shadows, and he jumped, but it disappeared when he looked directly at it. The black van drove past, going in the other direction. I keep thinking that van's going to screech to a halt, and agents with guns pile out and kill everyone. Welcome to hybrid reality, said Haley. He liked it when they talked like this. It excited him. Really, the brain is the biggest sexual organ. He turned and kissed her. She leaned against his shoulder as they walked on. Big cue at the taxi rack, Leon said. They were a block away, crossing the intersection. Did you notice people looking at you in the foyer? What? Leanne could feel a chill speeding along his veins towards his heart. I don't know why, but you were getting some strange looks. It was like a stone hitting a windscreen. His fragile sense of calm shattered into a thousand tiny pieces. He couldn't move his legs. 
He stepped onto the footpath and stopped. Ahead were twenty or more people waiting in the brightly lit taxi wreck. He had to get as far away as possible. Haley kept asking what was wrong. How could he explain any of it? He couldn't make sense of it himself. He looked down at the side street. It was dark and inviting. I've got to go, he said. Haley was hanging on to his arm. Tell me what's wrong, she said. Her face was thrust forward. Sometimes extreme situations make you see more clearly. She shone with intense feeling and well-met concern. Haley really was quite a special person, but... But he couldn't think of that now. Not this minute. He needed to be by himself, somewhere quiet, before he lost his mind. Please, just tell me, said Haley. I can't. I don't even... I don't... The words were all stuck together. And he thought it just occurred to him that maybe Haley had something to do with it all. He pulled away, stepped back. Haley stumbled. He stepped away, step by step. Leon! Then he turned and walked as fast as he could down the side street. It became darker as he went. Maybe Haley did have something to do with it. Some film theory experiment? Like, why did she call it hyper-reality? Splice in some extra images? It would only take a few shots. Was that less intense than other possibilities? He wanted to see where he was, to look around, but he couldn't make himself lift his head. He had the overwhelming feeling that if he didn't look at anyone, they wouldn't be able to see him. The street ended at the river. There was an ineffectual street lamp to the right. Directly above was a ramp leading down to a ferry terminal that was closed in darkness except for two pale security lights. Beyond, small boats rowed at anchor on the slick black water. Leon turned left and stopped in the shadow behind an old industrial building. There were two ground floor windows with bars and wire mesh and a door covered in graffiti. He leaned against the wall, closed his eyes, and breathed that particular mud, oil, and decay smell of rivers that have flown through large cities. Sweat crawled over his ribs. A violent trembling came and went in his limbs. He wondered if he was having some kind of breakdown. The silhouette of a barge crept along the river. Somewhere, a young woman laughed. He slid down the wall until he was sitting on the ground. He noticed the clothes early in the film. Fairly generic clothing, admittedly, but still disconcerting especially when the film itself had put him on edge. Then, towards the end, a single drop of blood landed on a piece of glass. And as the blood trickled, the focus changed to reveal briefly, for the first and only time, a reflection of the victim's face. His face. The face Leon saw every day in the bathroom mirror. Which was clearly absurd. But then the human brain is programmed to see faces in anything. Any stain or smudge. Under psychological distress, for example, if you've been primed by seeing your own clothes and hadn't had enough sleep, then you might see your own face in any mottled shadow. That's all it was. He knew that's all it was. He could hear laughter and see the red ends of cigarettes on the ferry terminal ramp. Stress, tiredness, and a brain like his that was always working, always whirring away at top speed, full of ideas and imagination, a huge creative imagination like his, always testing concepts, what his father referred to as his overactive imagination. That's all this was. He looked up at the three U's, pushing and shoving, walked into the light. One of them noticed him, and they began sauntering in his direction. Leon's brain stopped working. He peered blankly out through his eyeballs. He recognized the three young women, of course. The haircuts, the stretch jeans, the bottle of vodka. Taller than he expected. They stood around him, speaking French. The one with the close-cropped hair leaned over and dribbled spit onto the top of his head. The one with the eyebrow ring poked him with a stick she picked up from somewhere. For a time, he tried to will himself out of existence, which seemed easier than standing up, but eventually he struggled to his feet. He felt like some small animal prodded out from under a log, trembling and quivering. He supposed they would drag him through that graffiti door soon, but then some primitive spark jolted through his apathy. Why wasn't he fighting back and trying to escape before it was too late? He attempted to just walk away, but they boxed him in, pushed him back against the wall. He swiveled toward the closest youth and punched her in the stomach, turned back toward the ones carrying the stick, and kicked out, connecting with a knee. Then he ran. They screamed abuse, but didn't seem to be following. Leon zigzagged for four or five blocks before stopping for breath. He leaned against the wall, gasping and listening for the sound of pursuit. There was none. The lane he was in was deserted, but appeared to be a dead end. The buildings were mostly disused commercial premises. He crossed to the other footpath and walked along, pushing on doors until one swung open. He felt so tired. He just wanted a hole to crawl into. It was dark inside, and he leaned back against the door until he heard the lock click. 
the gloom felt more protective than frightening. Eventually, he removed his backpack, sat on the floor with his shoulders against the door and closed his eyes. Everything seemed to whisper and crackle and shimmer. He was pretty sure he could believe anything right now. Astral travel, alien abductions, ghosts, conspiracy theories. How fragile his mind was. Education meant nothing. A little terror and all rational thought was stripped away. But then, what did all those philosophers say? Plato, Kant, Descartes, Derrida. Nothing is objectively true. Just shadows on a cave wall. He stopped thinking for a while. He hoped Haley was okay. He liked her better than he'd been admitting to himself. She probably hated him right now. Grimy, fluorescent lights flickered to life, roused him. He lifted his head from his chest. His eyes were blurry. Dust floated in front of century-old stained wallpaper. The building had been gutted and the floor was strewn with the rubbish. There was a bench piled with flattened cardboard boxes and packing materials. He realized where he was moments before he heard their voices and the three of them clattered into the room. The word Regal on an arch was still visible. He'd come in the back entrance behind where the screen would once have been. One thing he completely missed about the film, though, it should have been obvious. It was set in a derelict cinema. It brought extreme violence inside a cinema and made a film about violence in the cinema. The three young women had noticed him now and grinned to each other as they wandered away from the bench. One of them had picked up an orange box cutter and was sliding a blade in and out. Another was swinging a hammer. Leon was shaking uncontrollably. He'd forgotten to put his jacket on. He'd forgotten to put his jacket on. He should have put the jacket on. Then this couldn't have happened. It was his own fault. It was his own stupid fault. The youths were laughing and making comments in French. They looked pleased with themselves, as though they found a bag of free money or a perfect victim. He felt if he peered through the gloom, he could see people in rows in the dark, waiting and expectant. The teenager with the eyebrow ring knelt and raised the hammer. She had the sweetest smile. The hammer was going to crush the second finger on his left hand. Wherever he moved his hand, it would end up in precisely the right place to have the finger bone crushed and the flesh and bone burst through the skin. He remembered that carefully composed shot. There'd be a yogurt container in the dust nearby. Leon knew exactly what was going to happen for the next 112 minutes. He knew when he'd scream, and when he'd beg. He couldn't help it. He began to cry. I am six feet two inches tall. I am built like a prop forward, which I used to be, and I have a hoodie from my old judo club. I wore it to breakfast one day when we went on holiday to Yosemite National Park, and an old guy in the line passed me and grinned and said, I wouldn't wrestle ya. And that made me feel pretty great, not gonna lie. But it also made me feel slightly fraudulent. I've been in measurable danger on the street twice. That is a vanishingly small amount, due partially to my gender and partially to my size. During an especially bad period of flooding in York, I stopped on one of the bridges to look at the water a few feet below. Do you ever get that sense of someone just starting to invade your personal space and doing so at speed? I got that, and I turned at the exact moment the guy behind me was either accelerating in or waving off on what, at the very least, would have been an attempt at my wallet, and what, I suspect, would have been an attempt at throwing me off the bridge. He walked past, made a joke about how high the water was, and kept looking back at me until he was out of my eye line. The second time was in Leeds, walking home from a show. I was on one of the back roads by the Corn Exchange, and again caught a flash of movement, too fast, too near. The dude walked past, eyes down, too quickly. I waited for him to go, and then I retraced my steps and went back to the station a different way. On both occasions, the adrenaline dump basically rendered me unable to move for 30 seconds. On both occasions, at worst, it would have been a mugging, but a mugging is still pretty worst. The old guy at Yosemite may have not wanted to wrestle me, but I don't want to fight anyone else either. That's where the size comes in. A lot of the time I look like someone it's too much bother to mess with. So I don't get messed with. But I felt what this character feels, not just in this kind of situation, but in the sickly way that the horror gets under his skin. 
I felt that in my bones. Because while I'm over 600 episodes in here and watch horror movies and TV shows an awful lot, there are still things that, frankly, can still sweep my feet and dump me ass first on the mat. The Mothman Prophecies is not a movie I can watch in daylight. I've watched it several times, I freely admit. I think it's one of the best horror movies of the latter half of the 20th century. It's also the single movie that perfectly captures the through the looking glass feeling of paranormal phenomena, what British ufologist Jenny Randalls coined the term the Oz Factor to describe, and weirdly that will be something that comes up in a later end cap this month too. Laura Linney has never been better than she is in The Mothman Prophecies. Richard Gere has never been better. The soundtrack is amazing. None of it matters. If I catch it in the wrong frame of mind, it terrifies me. Like, full-on small mammal hiding from dinosaur terrifies me. Richard Gere's character has lost people. So have I. He's a journalist. So am I. He's alive. So am I. He meets a badass, deeply compassionate American lady who anchors him when he needs it the most. Get out of my head, movie! I joke both because I can and I must. That sensation I talk about so much in these essays of something unknowable brushing against you in that movie, for me, it turns and looks at you as well. Something incredible. Something awe-inspiring and rich and strange and something we all want to search for but no one wants to see. That's what this character feels, and that, coupled with a total lack of self-confidence as he slowly collapses into the role of victim, I felt that too. But I don't feel it now, and neither should you. Cover up. Stay strong. Walk the other way. Watch cartoons until the bad thing is washed out of your brain because you are the star in your narrative, not the victim. And anyone who tells you otherwise has lousy taste in movies. What a fantastic, insidious story. Thanks to you both. We are blessed insofar as we are entirely donation funded and your donations enable us to pay pro rates and pay the vast majority of our staff. There is one group at the moment we can't pay, and we are working towards. That's our slush readers. These are the people who interact with every story that comes in. Their work is endless, exhausting, heroic, and unrewarded across the industry. We want, very badly, to be one of the first organizations that rewards them. We are very close to being able to do that. And with your help, we can get there. We know times are very tough at the moment and very weird mostly weird often very tough and we also know that money is a concern for basically everyone so if you can't help financially there are other ways you can help that i will discuss but if you can please consider going to pseudopod.org and clicking on feed the pod there you can either donate as much or as little as you would like a five buck a month subscription gets you some pretty great special super secret audio stuff that gets updated regularly too. You can do the same thing over at Patreon, where five bucks a month gets you that secret audio, and ten bucks and fifteen bucks and up gets you some very, very interesting extra perks. Regardless, it all goes to the same place. It all goes to helping this weird, wonderful, complex job be slightly better rewarded for the amazing people I'm honored to work with. So if you can help out there, please do. Alternatively, if you can't, then please consider maybe helping raise our profile a little bit. Uh, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever you grab the shows from. Um, maybe write a blog about an episode that you really liked or link to it on Twitter or any of that stuff. If you want to talk to us for an interview, if you want us to guest on something, please get in touch. We would absolutely love to. Regardless, thank you so much for your help. Without you, we literally could not do this. Pseudopod will return next week with Tenderizer by Stephen Graham Jones, read by Eric Luke, audio produced by Marty, and hosted by me. Then, as now, it will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. And I leave you with this line from the Mothman Prophecies, because I'm feeling brave. In your shoe... Under the bed. 
see you next week folks it's a pseudopod it's a big foot it's all about podcasts these days